Good morning, everybody. God bless you wherever you are, however you are joining us today. I want to thank you for joining us in our online worship from First United Methodist Church in Hanover, Pennsylvania. We're coming to you from the sanctuary of uh, the Frederick Street campus and know that even though there is some distance physically from us, we are connected in this moment by the same Holy Spirit who raised Christ from the dead, the same Holy Spirit that's bringing life and renewal in faith in each of our lives and in our community. So I welcome you. We've got a lot that we're going to be praying through today. We've got a lot to discuss. Uh, God's uh, Holy Scripture, the message that God has for you, is going to answer a very important question about leadership. And the question is, the disciples chose to follow Jesus, which meant they chose Jesus as their leader. What does it take? What does a leader need to offer us to be a reliable leader, an effective leader, a spiritual and a godly leader? Well, we're going to see from the godliest leader who has ever led today, and that's Jesus Christ. So I'm glad that you are with us. We're going to open up this time of worship now with some singing. Thank you. 
eternal rock from year's beginning to its end. God is faithful. In each day, God is present. In each action, God comes close. Through all eternity, God is trustworthy. Yesterday, today, and forever. Sustaining, enlivening, making all things new. God is the eternal rock. Welcome to worship. Listen, I have to show off my sparkle mask because I think it's cool and I wanted everybody to see that it sparkles. So here I am. So today's scripture tells about two disciples that were called by Jesus. The first one is Philip and Philip is talking to Jesus and he's like, oh my Jesus, you're so cool. I'm going to go tell my friend Nathaniel. So he runs to his friend Nathaniel who's sitting under a tree. Nathaniel, there's this cool leader. You need to come and follow him with me. He's so awesome. He talks about love and peace and hope and he comes from Nazareth. And of course, Nathaniel's like, does anything good come out of Nazareth? Okay, I'll come with you. So they go to Jesus. And Jesus says something interesting to Nathaniel. He's, he says, I know who you are. I've known you. I saw you sitting under a tree. And I know what's inside you. You know that's so cool that Jesus can see what's inside all of us? It's almost like, you know how like doctors have a stethoscope and they can hear our hearts, but Jesus knows what's inside our hearts. Jesus knows if we have love in our hearts. Jesus knows if we have joy in our hearts and peace and kindness and hope. Jesus knows what's in our heart. What's in your heart? What do you think Jesus sees in you? Let's pray together. We just thank you, God, for knowing us and seeing what's in our hearts. And we know we have lots of love for you. Amen. Hey, guys, remember, wash your hands, say your prayers, because germs and Jesus are everywhere. Bye. The scripture lesson for today is from John 1, 43 to 51. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the, in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. This might seem like a strange question for a preacher of the gospel to ask, but why would anybody choose to follow Jesus? It's a fair question. It's actually the question of the day that Philip and Andrew are wrestling with. Because you can do whatever you want to with your life. You can choose who you will listen to and who you won't listen to. You don't have to follow anyone in this life if you don't want to. As Americans, we're raised to admire the heroes who are rugged loners, 
like the cowboy alone on the open range, or the pioneer who leaves the civilized towns back east to carve out a life for themselves in the wilderness. Our founding documents boldly proclaim that we are endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights, such as life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That means that we're free to think what we want to think, do what we want to do, and choose what we want to choose, so long as we don't infringe upon the life and the liberty and the pursuit of happiness of others. But other than that, it's up to us. The truly free among us, so the teaching goes, are those who think for themselves, who choose their own path and priorities, and they chart their own destiny, rather than being led around by the nose by someone else. The Canadian rock group Rush sums that up beautifully in their song Tom Sawyer with the line, his mind is not for rent to any god or government. That's true independence. Now we love freedom and we love independence. We hate to be told what to do, but if we are honest, the truly independent thinkers are few and far between. Most of us, even when we're moving against the grain, seek a leader. And one of my definitions, my favorite definitions of a leader is, a leader is needed to help a group of people get somewhere that they could never reach on their own. And we tend to choose leaders who are saying what we want to hear, or who are leading us in a direction that we already want to go. A true leader, though, will go beyond that. They will not only tell us what we want to hear, but they'll also tell us the truth about the things that we need to hear. But we must be extremely careful when choosing who we are going to follow, because following requires our loyalty, our trust, and our commitment. And frankly, not everyone is worthy of our trust and loyalty and commitment. I think about the young people who followed Charles Manson back in the 1960s. They were swept up in his teaching and, and he filled their heads with all kinds of stuff. And they followed him with blind and absolute loyalty. And that blind loyalty led to the murder of innocent people. And it remains a dark moment in our history. In the 70s, hundreds of well-meaning people followed the Reverend Jim Jones with blind and absolute loyalty, and that unquestioning devotion led to a mass suicide. Following well means following direction of our leaders faithfully, you know, like an obedient soldier in combat. But if the one giving the orders is not worthy, it quickly becomes a tragic waste. You know, even a dutiful soldier is obligated to resist an illegal or an immortal order, uh, immoral order. At the Nuremberg war crimes trials following World War II, every Nazi soldier who took the stand, they defended their participation in genocide by saying, we were only following orders. They were. And Hitler gave those orders and led them astray and inspired a new standard of military conduct that soldiers must reject orders that cross the line of decency. Because not every would-be leader or would-be messiah is safe to follow. Now this might come as a shock, but Jesus was not the first inspiring firebrand to stand up in Jerusalem and proclaim himself the messiah. There was a long line of people who claimed to be God's promised messiah, who wanted to lead a rebellion against the occupying force of Rome. They tapped into the very real frustration and the very real suffering of the people, and they told them what they wanted to hear. They led them in a direction that they already wanted to go, rebellion against Rome. And many of these uprisings naturally led to violence and conflict, ambushing Roman soldiers and burning down Roman army barracks, attacking Israelites who they thought were collaborating too much with Rome and selling out their own people. And every single one of these would-be messiahs was crushed by Rome because one person's freedom fighter is another person's terrorist. There's a famous story about Pontius Pilate crucifying a thousand captured rebels on a single day. And the cross is holding their dying bodies lined the roads in and out of Jerusalem for several miles in each direction. And it was up there as a warning against future rebellion and insurrection. Now, I think that has to have been in Philip and Nathaniel's mind when they met Jesus and they made the rock-solid decision to follow him. And that question is, was Jesus worthy of their absolute loyalty? 
Was Jesus worthy of their sacrifice? Notice I say absolute loyalty and not blind loyalty. There is a difference. Absolute loyalty is the complete and unwavering commitment that's grounded in a deep and thoughtful trust. That's the obedience of soldiers committed to the overall mission to defend and protect. Blind loyalty is the demand of the corrupt and the dangerous who simply want to get their way and to avoid scrutiny and accountability. Abuse can flourish when a leader is not to be questioned. That's cult leaders. That's dictators who tell us to ignore what we see with our own eyes or, and, and take their word for it. Or to ignore what we hear with our own ears and, and, and trust the dictator to do the thinking for us. You know, ignore my example and follow my instruction. Do as I say, but not as I do. They weave a tapestry of bold-faced lies and they create a reality around their people and they feed it to their followers as truth, ultimately controlling their hearts and their minds and even their actions. It was the French philosopher Voltaire who said, anyone who can make you believe absurdities can also make you commit atrocities. Jim Jones, Charles Manson, atrocities like murdering innocent people in cold blood, or drinking poisoned Kool-Aid, or more recently, storming the Capitol and attacking police to stop an election that you disagree with. That's why the song says his mind is not for rent to any god or government, because there are far too many gods and governments and would-be messiahs that simply cannot be trusted. We turn our brains off and we blindly follow at our own peril. And when it all blows up in the end, we can complain that we've been deceived or misled, but ultimately it is our responsibility to ask the hard questions of our leaders and our saviors. Every one of the original disciples had to answer the same question that we have to answer. Is Jesus worthy of our trust and our loyalty? Is Jesus telling us the truth? Is Jesus acting in our best interest or simply using us to further his own selfish ambitions? We each have to answer that for ourselves by asking those critical questions and paying attention to the evidence of what we see with our own eyes and hear with our own ears. Jesus has nothing to hide from us. Jesus welcomes the scrutiny and questions and the accountability because he'll hold up under it. Jesus tell us, tells us clearly who he represents and what he stands for. Jesus remains consistent to that. And he lays out what his mission is and what we can expect if we join him. Jesus may demand absolute commitment and loyalty, but not blindness and blind loyalty. Is Jesus worthy of that kind of trust? Well, first and foremost, we as a church believe that Jesus is divine the son of the living God in human form. But at this point in the story, Philip and Nathaniel don't know that yet. The divine nature of Christ also includes the divine guidance of the Holy Spirit. And that's important to note. None of us are capable of fully grasping the enormity of Jesus without some help. We are saved by grace, the scripture says, which means God provides us the help that we need to trust Jesus completely. Philip, Nathaniel, and all the rest of the first disciples were seeking God's guidance about the Messiah for quite some time. Just ahead, in this same chapter that we read, several of the fishermen, like Peter and his brother, they met Jesus in the crowd while listening to John the Baptist. And they prayed deeply for God to fulfill what John was promising. And there is a proper way to pray, you know. We don't beg God to give us what we think we want. We don't ask God to confirm the choice that we've already made, but we ask God to show us objectively what God has chosen. So if we are never surprised by God's response to our prayers, maybe we're not doing it right. Jesus, the carpenter's son from Nazareth, was not what Nathaniel was expecting. He asks, Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? It was a backwater. I think maybe the American version of this might be Buffalo. Can anything good come out of Buffalo? Or Cleveland. Can anything good come out of Cleveland? Why not important cities like Washington, D.C. or New York? Why not glamorous cities like L.A. or Miami? But remember what the prophet Isaiah once wrote. He said, as heaven is higher than earth, so God's ways are higher than our ways. 
That means God is going to surprise us because he's going to choose things that we wouldn't. Jesus was a surprise. Jesus demonstrates also an unusual ability to perceive and understand things that are beyond most of our grasp. He saw, as Deb said a moment ago, right into Nathanael's heart, and he judged his character. Behold, here is an Israelite in whom there is no dishonesty or deceit. If only all of our leaders and saviors were such good judges of character. Amen? Jesus also never pandered to the would-be disciples to try to win them over. He didn't beg them to follow him. He was not on the campaign trail to convince people to get on board. Jesus was the genuine article. He was authentic. He was confident in himself. Now, i got to say, it seems odd for me to say that, hey, Jesus is confident about himself. As the son of the living God, of course he's going to be confident in himself and not insecure. But, you know, we can tell false bravado and bluster apart from the weight of genuine character. And Jesus had the genuine character. If only all of our leaders were that authentic and genuine. Amen? Now, no disrespect intended to our human leaders. As a pastor, I'm a human leader. We're all human, we're all sinful and mortal, and therefore we are all flawed. We can look for many of the same things in our human leaders, though, that we find in Jesus. Here's another thing that we find in Jesus. Belief in Jesus was made more likely for Philip and Nathaniel because of a face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus. It's one thing to hear about Jesus and learn about Jesus. It's quite another to meet him. We are moved and we are changed with an encounter with the real Jesus, not just a consideration of our thoughts about Jesus. And that is also possible for us to have. It's a spiritual meeting rather than a face-to-face -face meeting, but he is just as real in this room today as you and me. Many of you are here today in worship because you love the people of our church, you've enjoyed the preaching of our pastors through the years, but ultimately you are here because you met Jesus personally, and that changes things. Jesus would go on to demonstrate far more amazing things than these. But these answers, the question of why Philip and Nathaniel would choose to follow, it was Jesus' divinity and guidance of the Holy Spirit. It was revealed through genuine and persistent prayer. It was revealed through a face-to-face -face encounter with Christ, meeting him personally. It is in the strength of his character, his consistency with the values of God through the ages, and his ability to surprise and delight us in ways that we never imagined. And in time, he reveals to these same disciples a power that is impossible to find in anyone else. If you've chosen Jesus already, just hold on to him. Trust him. And don't be afraid to follow him where he leads you, even if the request surprises you. And if you haven't yet made that decision, I want you to pray this week to meet him. And you will see for yourself. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, God bless you. Amen. It has been another crazy week in God's creation, amen? Uh, it seems like every time I start uh, a worship time of prayer, we keep saying things like, we must pray for our nation. Yeah, we must pray for our nation. You know why, you've seen it. Uh, now the fallout from what happened uh, last week at the Capitol continues, and, and we need to know how do we move forward, not just to get our pound of flesh, um, but how do we move together, united as a nation, together? That's what we're all praying for. One nation under God. Uh, I believe that the under God part helps us remain one nation. But that's probably another whole sermon for another day. But I want to pray today for our nation. I also want to pray for some concerns here in our local Hanover community. Um, we have continued uh, to be praying for our friends here at First Church who have been in the hospital, out of the hospital. We've had some successful surgeries. We've got some people that are still on the mend. We've got some people that are still struggling financially. And I'm going to talk to that uh, in a moment when we talk about giving. But uh, let's take just a deep breath, <sighs> cleanse ourselves from the stress of the day, close our eyes, and let's be in the holy presence of God. And let us pray. 
our most gracious and loving God, um, we trust you. We trust you more than we trust anyone else. Because as heaven is higher than the earth, so your ways are higher than your ways. You do have a way of surprising us. You even, Lord, sometimes have a way of frustrating us because sometimes you will choose something very different than what we're begging you for. Help us to have the depth of faith to trust you when the answer to our prayers is no. Because you've got something else in mind. That's hard. I've heard it said, Lord, that you can learn a lot about a person by how they behave when they don't get their way. That's true for all of us, especially when we're praying for things that are legitimate and needed and holy, like the healing of a loved one who is struggling in the hospital. We ask, Lord, that you forgive us our sins, each of us individually who are worshiping you this day, but also collectively as a human race. We are so grateful that you are patient because every day that this world turns, there is another atrocity, there is another disappointment, there's another ugly scene that unfolds somewhere, which is why, Lord, we know that we cannot ultimately rely upon ourselves and our own wisdom, but that we need your guidance. We need a savior. We need Jesus. We also believe, Lord, that we are closer this day to Christ's return than we have ever been before. And if you were to return this week, we would love it. We give our lives into your hands, asking for the forgiveness of our sins, asking for the guidance of your Holy Spirit, that we might take responsibility for ourselves in the choices that we make, in the directions that we choose to walk. And that as followers of Christ, Lord, that we might truly be following and serving your will and not our own. That is the prayer of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane before he accepted the cross. Not our will be done, but yours. Lord God, that is probably the hardest prayer in the world for us to pray and really mean it and really live with the consequences of it. But we're going to dare together as a congregation who's worshiping across the miles, we're going to dare to pray that today. Not what we want, O oh God, but we ask you to have what you want. Open our eyes to understand it and recognize it. And make our hearts pliable and flexible that we can get on board with where you are going. We continue to pray, Lord, for our Hanover community that is still dealing with the coronavirus surge. We really want to be open for worship. We thought that maybe we would be by now. Lord, we're praying that we're only just another week or two away from reopening on Sunday morning. But we want to do so safely. We want to pray for everyone in this nation and this world who have lost loved ones to this virus. But also, Lord, those who have struggled to deal with it and those who are charged to contain it. We pray for all those who are leading the effort to vaccinate the world. That is a massive undertaking. And so we pray for our leaders at every level who are working to keep us safe so that hopefully soon, oh God, we can put this endless pandemic behind us. Continue, Lord, to soothe us by your spirit because we are frustrated and we are disappointed. And bring us back together face to face soon. As we pray for our nation and our world and our own lives as disciples of Jesus Christ, we thank you for your patience with us. We thank you for your love and your kindness and your care. And lastly, Lord, I just want to ask that you will guide us to be able, despite all that's going wrong in our world right now, to still have eyes to recognize what is still beautiful in this world, what is still noble and admirable in this world, what is still trustworthy and good. And let us amplify what is noble and holy, and life-giving and good. This we pray, Lord, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.
because we want to follow you wherever you go. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, this is the time where I also want to thank you for your generosity and encourage you, uh, if you haven't given in a while or if you've never given remotely from home, there are a couple of ways that you can do that. And your generosity is changing lives here at First United Methodist Church. You can send a check through the mail to our church office. It's 200 Frederick Street, Hanover, Pennsylvania, 17331. Or you can call our church office at 717 717- 637-1574 and you can ask to talk to our finance office and they can set up online or uh, electronic giving, I mean, where your bank uh, wires your gifts directly to the church's bank. It's very easy to do and it's very helpful. And thirdly, you can go to our church website and you can click on the giving tab and you can use a program called Easy Tithe, which allows you to use a personal debit or credit card uh, and you can give your gift that way anytime you wish or you can even set it up to do, be a recurring gift at wherever you schedule. Uh, before I end this, this invitation to give, I, I have to say thank you. You have blown me away this past week with your generosity. I have been telling you stories for months about how you have been changing lives and helping people in some real tough positions through your giving to the pastor's discretionary fund. Uh, this past week, all of your gifts to the discretionary fund totaled $5,000. $940. That's a lot of money. And I just want you to know that that money is going out to help folks in our community just as quickly uh, as it comes in. Just this week, you have helped four different families get off the street uh, because they were kicked out of their homes, they lost their jobs because of COVID, and they were homeless. And you put a roof over their head. On behalf of those families, I thank you. You helped put food on the table for six different families. You also helped um, uh, somebody who, who needed a new pair of work boots so they could finally start a new job because the jobs are now opening back up with COVID. You bought that pair of work boots that they couldn't afford because they haven't worked and their unemployment still hasn't shown up. These are the things that you were doing. There are electric bills that I'm, we're gonna help with later today. I share that uh, because if you find yourself truly in need, if you're up against the wall and you don't know how you're going to keep the roof over your head, if you don't know where the next meal is coming from, please call us, please email us. We'd like to help you in any way that we can. And those of you that give so dramatically, um, God is moving you. When we saw how much came in this past week, uh, I said, Whenever God leads somebody to give that much money, I was tensed and ready to go because God knows that somebody was about to call and need it. And shortly after your checks arrived, the phone calls started. So know this, you have been used and guided by a holy God to do God's work this past week, and you continue to do so. So thank you uh, for supporting the Pastor's Discretionary Fund. Thank you for supporting those who are struggling uh, right here in the Hanover area. And um, just know that if you are able to keep giving in that way, we will keep branching out and we will be helping through there. Not just individual people, but also uh, some of the ministries that we support here around town, like the Hanover Area Council of Churches, who offers a free lunch every day at noon for anybody that wants it. They also offer the Changing Lives Homeless Shelter. Uh, we partner with Community Aid. We partner with uh, New Hope Ministries, who operates the largest and best stocked food pantry in town. All of this is how the Church of Jesus Christ is continuing to shine and be a voice for Christ in our community, even though the doors aren't open today. So continue to be a witness for Jesus Christ. Thank you for your generosity, and let me pray God's blessing upon you. Most gracious and loving Lord, you are doing wonderful things in and through the people of this worshiping community. Through their generosity, which you inspire, people are getting through the tough times. And we thank you. Because we know that you tell us we are to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, but we also love our neighbor in the same way that we love ourselves. Thank you, Lord. I thank you for the worshiping community of First United Methodist Church. 
who has stepped up and is loving their neighbor as they love their own selves. We ask you to bless the gifts that have come in, and we ask you to guide each and every dollar to help bring your reality, your kingdom, to its completion right here among us. All this we pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen and Amen. Thank you. I want to thank our liturgist, uh, Elaine Streeving, and cameraman, uh, Steve Streeving. We also want to thank Wayne Topper, who every week spends hours editing and putting all this together. Thank you all for your work this week. One of the reasons that I also uh, mentioned Steve and Elaine is as we were recording today, Steve pointed out something to me in our sanctuary here that I never saw before and I never knew, and I thought it, go, it went very, very well with uh, the message that we shared today, that our human leaders are inherently flawed because we're mortal. We are imperfect, that only God who is divine uh, is perfect. Um, he pointed out to me, and I'm going to step out of the way so you can see this, but in the stained glass window that is behind me in the Frederick Street Sanctuary, there are some squares. And you will notice that the square on the left-hand side, directly under the Apostle Peter, is different from all the other squares. You'll notice that it's a little lopsided, that the one line is touching the box instead of having a band of blue in between it. Do you all see what I'm, I'm talking about? That, uh, and evidently, it is, it is sometimes custom in stained glass windows to put a intentional mistake into the windows. And it was inspired by the, the artwork of uh, the Native Americans who, when they were doing their beadwork to give glory to the Great Spirit, they would sometimes intentionally add an extra bead or leave a colored bead out. They would intentionally make a mistake in their artwork as a way of proclaiming that we human beings are not perfect, that only the God that we serve is perfect. Just like we human leaders are imperfect and we are flawed and we do the best that we can, but only God is truly flawless and truly perfect. Those of you who worship in this sanctuary will never see that window the same way again. I know I haven't. But remember as we leave today that only God is perfect. Only God is without flaw. And God's heart is big enough to welcome all of us into his midst, no matter how flawed and imperfect we might be. I bless you, my friends, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, as we go in peace. Have a great week, everybody. Uh, keep your eyes and ears open for the evidence of God's grace around us, and represent him well as his ambassador. We'll see you next week. Thank you, and God bless.